thank you everyone for coming out on this dark night to say hello i really really appreciate it great to see familiar faces again uh, um, thank you especially to uh, steve engler and and to courtney uh, michael for for arranging this um, when they asked me about a year ago if i would be a uh, a presenter for great presenters, I thought. My, maybe maybe I could relax a little bit if we called it pretty good presenters. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll get this show rolling. I know it's a it's a scary time in the world, and maybe we'll have an hour to not think about all of that. And um, and if I could start with a moment of uh, of thanks uh, to my college. There were a lot of them, and some wonderful men, women um, who got me going and, and sustained me through, through many years uh, as postgraduate as well. And to others who have formed and supported me, you folks are in this room. So much, so much for, for all of the psychological uh, support that you've given me over the years. Um, and a special uh, shout out to the Michigan Council for the Arts for awarding me a fellowship. Um, finally, I, I, I need to say, uh, maybe some one of the people that would like to remain anonymous are my, my neighbors who uh, have been kind enough not to cut down their trees and, and not to prune their trees uh, that have given me um, uh, such inspiration over the past several years. So let's, let's start on a, on a moment of levity, and then we'll get into something a little more serious, and I'll tell you about my mother. <laughs> oh, Sorry about that. So it got it. Maybe you press got it? Yes. Oh. Sorry about that. All right. There we go. Could this be Ed Bruce's first draft of his hit song? Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be painters. <laughs> don't let them make drawings and buy stuff from them. <laughs> make them be doctors and take jobs you pay. Uh, I, I guess not. Okay. Not for the serious stuff. <laughs> Here I am in my studio. <laughs> I, I don't think I was quite two. Um, I found this photo in my mother's house. Uh, just recently, uh, and strangely enough, this this sunroom looks a whole lot like my studio now. Uh, those windows with uh, gridded mullions, and um, there's a little figure coming off the other side. I think that's my sister. Um, but there I am with my feet not quite on the ground uh, at my table doing something important. Um, and here's where mom comes in. Uh, soon after I learned to walk, I learned that I liked to draw. My mother, with two toddlers and three more yet to come, gave me a baker's pastry brush and a coffee can that she filled with water. She sent me outside to the cement driveway to paint. My drawings darkened the pavement, but the images dried quickly in the sun, making fresh surfaces for new drawings. Those mason-edged cement squares were picture frames that foreshadowed the square bias proportions of my paintings today. I had been working this past summer on a 60-inch square, maybe the same size as those driveway squares. I spoke to my mother today, and she thought maybe that was true. <laughs> the round baker's brush predicted my preference for artist rounds rather than flat brushes. I like my oil paint a little runny. Tall trees and flowering bushes that also shaded that child's yard are now my subject matter. Green and a variety of cement and asphalt grays are my favorite colors. And comparing the colors of the foliage and, and the pavement and the shade and the sunshine has become my life's work. It's likely that I was drawing with water before I was talking in sentences could a career choice be more predictable? As that child painter, I was witness to the day's delights, 
watching the sun and clouds move across the sky, the shifting shadows on cement squares, the coming and going of neighbors, the kids returning from school, the daily visits of the milkman and letter carriers. Today, an aging painter in my yard, I clock the day with those same shadows, the sound of the mail truck accelerating from the mailbox, and the peripheral yellow flash of the afternoon school bus about to drop off the neighborhood children. Working from life in plein air, as they say, is about being in life, feeling full, breathing that air, experiencing and feeling the gifts and awe of an ordinary day. The first museum show that I remember seeing was the Alexander Calder at the Guggenheim in New York in 1964. The Guggenheim had just opened, um, and this was a class trip. Uh, I think I was in the eighth grade. We all got into the into the bus and went to New York and and uh, strolled down the ramp. I loved Calder, and um, during that show, and uh, maybe it wasn't an accident that when I first went to college and started studying art, I I took a sculpture class. Uh, with with a wonderful man named Erwin Hauer. This is a, a sculpture that he made in the Yale Art Gallery. Um, Erwin uh, is a spatial genius um, and um, always was talking uh, in a supernatural way that very few of us could really uh, understand perfectly. Um, I took seven semesters of sculpture from him uh, during my four years of college. I also studied with Bernard Che. Uh, these are some Che paintings from the from the uh, Abraham Museum. Um, I just shot this recently, and uh, Bernard Bernard's line was, "Every day is a good painting day," mm -hmm. uh, and I I took that I take that to heart. And I try to make that true for myself. And William Bailey, these are my three fathers away from home. Uh, William Bailey, um, I recently, um, his, his uh, famous line is, there is no advanced painting. I love that. And all art is abstract. Bailey's work seems of the three to be the most naturalistic, the most representation. And yet, Bill did not paint from life. Uh, these still lifes are invented from his head. He draws from life, or he, he drew from life, but um, he chose to invent his paintings uh, in the studio. I was lucky enough after I graduated to win a traveling fellowship to study in Europe. Um, a self-designed project to see and uh, see again the paintings of Manet. I proposed a project where I would go to the places that Manet went as a young man, um, to Madrid, uh, to see Velazquez and Goya, uh, to uh, Holland to see Rembrandt and Franz Hals. Um, and, um, and I made my my hub, Paris, and I, I stay for a year. Um, here I am on top of the Notre Dame Cathedral with my parents, uh, my father behind and my mother peeking out between us, the woman who inspired me to paint with a pastry brush and water. In Europe, I saw Velasquez and Manet, Velasquez in, in Madrid. Um, it's marvelous to see those things uh, firsthand. And um, in Manet, this wonderful portrait of Zola that's in the Dorset Museum. I don't know if this made it to New York. Maybe some of you have already seen that show. Uh, will, will tell me. I'm hoping to see the, the Manet and Degas show at the Met uh, soon. Um, please keep in mind that most of the, the photographs that I'm showing you today, um, I I have either shot myself with my trusty iPhone 
uh, or camera, um, uh, or I I crib from the from online from Instagram or some other place. Uh, also keep in mind that no one here will see any paintings that I made today. You'll only see photographs of the paintings mm -hmm. I made today. Um, when Courtney explained to me that uh, that this room had a projector and the projector was old, uh, she could probably hear me sigh. <laughs> uh, and I requested that we have another monitor to make certain comparisons. Um, but uh, you need to keep in mind that a photograph taken by me or someone else and uh, that ends up online and then ends up as a screenshot on my on my desktop and then becomes a PowerPoint and then it's projected uh, through an unfamiliar projector um, is uh, an experience that's many times removed from the original. And no one who has seen this projection has actually seen Manet's portrait of Zola. I went to the Courtauld Museum and saw this wonderful Seurat. I'm, I'm in love with Seurat. Mm -hmm. and, and I made a special trip to see uh, the painting on the right by Mondrian, uh, maybe the best tree ever painted. Uh, I don't know if it seems to have much oomph right now as a as a many times removed image. Uh, you can see I stole it from in, from the internet, um, but uh, it's a, certainly a marvelous thing. Um, I tried to paint my first tree around early eighties, I think. Uh, this is the first one that I thought was any good, and. It's not a very good photograph, but it's a tiny little painting, eight and in, 10 inches square. Um, and I painted it on a fire escape uh, that sat outside the window of my Brooklyn apartment. And I, I would say it's probably the first representational landscape that I painted that I really felt gave me a chance to look forward. Um, <coughs> I painted it in three hours. I don't think I've made a painting in three hours since. <laughs> um, it still hangs in our house. And uh, it becomes for me a touchstone of, uh, of a promise of what I could be. Ah, uh, third grade. <laughs> I wrote a little book um, inspired by Dr. Seuss, of course. Uh, Dr. Seuss's book, uh, The Cat in the Hat, was published in 1957, I think, um, the year I was in first grade. And um, I was crazy for it. So uh, I started making a book of my own. My first grade teacher seemed to notice that I could draw pretty well. and But this is third grade. Um, my my dad used to get his shirts uh, cleaned and they came back with cardboard and I could draw on the cardboard uh, with crayons. And so I made my own book of rocket ships. This is uh, image number three, I think. I don't know what this means. I still do not know what this is. The jet that once I met getting all caught in a big baggy net <laughs> is. Um, but 24 years later, I made another painting that Looks a lot like Big Baggy Net. Mm -hmm. um, my sister uh, owns the painting on the right, and and I'm glad she uh, enjoys it because it would might have ended up in the garbage uh, when I moved for the third or fifth or seventh time. Um, but um, I I regard it as a as a wonderful uh, curiosity of subject matter. And, and subject interpretation. And, and when I see it in our house, I actually like it. Um, and uh, it's a promise that perhaps I can do um, something more. On Tuesday nights in New York, in the old days, uh, the Met was free. And I'd love, to go, I'd love to go to the Met and see just one or two or three paintings. This was always high on the list. Peter Bruegel's. Uh, harvester's painting. So 
has the whole image on the right, and a detail of um, on a, a tree on the left. Um, this is very thinly painted, except where the tree uh, is kind of encrusted. Um, this dark paint has acquired a kind of waxy buildup that's um, very beautiful. Um, this, for me, is as good a painting as you can find at the map. Um, and uh, I would love to aspire to be something uh, like Bruegel in his comprehensive understanding of, of composition and color uh, and drawing and narrative and subject interpretation, technique, all beautiful things. There were some other painters that I would see at the Met, and one was a was a Corot painting. There's Camille Jean Baptiste Camille Corot on the right, um, and John Singer Sargent on the left. So he's he's in our minds today because of the show at the MFA. Um, here they are with their umbrellas, working in plein air. It wasn't until 1841 that artists could easily go outside because an American named John Rand. Uh, patented uh, a collapsible tube that artists could put pigments into, oil paints into, and carry them easily into the landscape. Before that, um, artists carried their work paints around in pig bladders. Uh, and uh, that was a, a very challenging uh, way to try to work outside. Here's uh, a John Singer Sargent painting on the left, uh, a picture of Monet. Working. So these artists are celebrating the act of, of artists now painting outside directly in the landscape. And we have that wonderful Corot tree on the right, which I think is one of the most marvelous trees uh, in the world. Tiny little painting. I still go back and look at that tree at the minute. And then mm -hmm. we also have to have the naysayers. <laughs> the jokesters. Here's Salvatore Dali. Oh, sorry. sorry. Salvatore Dali uh, showing us how it's done in the canals of Venice. Plenty of problems. Oh, lugging umbrellas, paints, brushes, palettes, canvas, battling sun and rain, heat and cold, damn mosquitoes, ticks, getting there, getting home. You know, uh, there are places we all like to paint, them. we realize that it takes an hour or two to get there, and an hour or two to get home, and there's gas, and there's traffic. Um, why not just take a few photographs and work from those in the studio? For many painters, photography has enriched the studio experience. Photography freezes a moment, and we rarely question the color accuracy. We can throw away the images without fuss or expense, no problem, right? I like to take photographs. Everybody knows, uh, everybody who knows me knows that I post on social media photographs that I've taken. Um, I love photography for the immediacy and especially for the visual coincidences that sometimes make images with ambiguous readings. <clears throat> Pictures that fool us, surprise us, delight us with their either or faces. Pictures that are photo specific. In other words, they're not translated easily to another medium. Using them, I could not make paintings that make sense to me as paintings. They are photo ideas only for me. Um, the photo on the left, I just made by twirling my iPhone while I took the photograph. <laughs> the photograph on the right was something I found on my walk. And I love when you can just find this stuff and, and uh, call it your own. How do cameras record the scene before the lens? One eye, automatic settings for focus and frame, aperture speed, light balance. Then we have these options. These are all those options that you know you have on your iPhone and you don't know what to do with. <laughs> Exposure, brightness, brilliance. If you want to know, I'll, I'll tell you on what those differences are. They're very subtle. <laughs> Highlight, shadows, black point, contrast, saturation, vibrance. Saturation, vibrance, really related, but different. Tint, warmth, sharpness, definition, noise reduction, blah, blah, blah. How can we make pictures closest to how we see? 
How do we see with or without cameras? Can we even see without cameras? Where is fact and where is fiction? Are you feeling some doubt? Here's my white canvas set, photographed with my iPhone set on auto on the left. My white canvas on my white wall of my studio with a manual adjustment for aperture. Most of us don't think about it. Here's my black shirt on an auto setting. Here's my black shirt with an auto an adjusted manually uh, calibrated aperture. Good to know when you shoot on auto. Your camera is set automatically to 18% reflectance. Some group of camera aficionados decided that, that was going to be it, mm -hmm. which means that dark subjects may record lighter, lighter subjects darker than you'd wish. These three garments shot separately on auto uh, are actually left, my white shirt in the middle, my gray sweater on the right, my black shirt, the same color. Mm -hmm. So you can learn to photograph, or you can be like Lucian Freud and paint directly from light. Mm -hmm. uh, here he is with Queen Elizabeth. And this is a very curious painting, uh, a very curious situation, too, to mm -hmm. have the queen uh, on, a, on a chair, on a raised platform uh, for the painter, working on a tiny little image. Um, my question would be, what might be here that is not in any photo of the queen? Um, first of all, Freud is very honest. Now that, that great chin is troubling, isn't it? Um, she doesn't look that happy to be posing in this picture. Um, we can speculate a lot of things that might be the reasons why Freud wanted to be next to the queen. Uh, that would be a, another discussion that could take us a very long time. Um, but it's an interesting subject because I, th I think sometimes Freud, at his best, captures something else. Maybe perfume, the cologne of the gentleman that he, that he paints. How does he do that? I don't have the answer. But he's there while this is happening. Let's put the camera away. What might be good in order for us to trust our perceptions without our phone? Well, we have foveable focus. We focus on something that's a very tiny thing, the necessity of moving on eyes. That's related with the foveal focus. So why don't you all just put your eye, say, I don't know, right there and hold it there and don't let your eyes move you'll all find in just a few seconds that you are functionally blind. You cannot see without moving your eyes. Then we have color interaction and light adaptation, and we'll talk about that in one second. But then this big elephant in the room, seeing is thinking and remembering. Light is electromagnetic information that enters the eye and runs a relay race to the occipital lobe, but then has to play pinball with a lot of other brain lobes that modify visual cognition. And this is why a soldier sees red differently than I do. And a doctor sees red differently than a soldier. Here's a painting by Ellsworth Kelly, red, green, blue. That's pretty bright, even brighter on my screen. So I'm looking here and looking at, oh my, what? The chili chair. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, we have light receptors in our eye, um, and we have a complicated way of seeing. I'm just going to take the red rectangle here and pop it on the screen. Now, there's a little something in the middle of the screen that I didn't put there, but I don't even know where it came from. But you can look. Oh, everybody, close one eye. Close one eye. And, and let's just look at this, look at the middle of the right back angle and, and, uh, and wait about 
10 seconds, 15 seconds. Um, I don't know if I can ask you to tell me what you see, but in my experience, like a shadow. the color changes, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And you might be seeing some other mm, yeah. accessory items, yeah. maybe some uh, some little sharp neon bands flying around the edges. Maybe uh, maybe the red is not the red that you started with. Keep that one eye closed now. And um, at least the way I describe it to myself is, oh, that fire engine red or that, that Elmo red is now turning into tomato soup red. You feel that too? Mm -hmm. Okay, once it turns tomato soup, Close that eye and open the other one. Mm -hmm. What happened? Right. It popped. It popped back to the saturated red that we started with. This is a kind of adaptation that happens to every color every time you look at something. And it happens even more aggressively on edges where red meets blue or light meets dark. Uh, one becomes stronger, one becomes weaker. Uh, we have this kind of interaction that a camera does not see. So maybe making a painting of something I see a lot would be a good way to find out what I see and how I see it. How to begin? Get some paint mm -hmm. or something, some colors to smear around. Find something to paint on. Decide how big to make the painting and how big to make the object on that surface. Almost that simple. I mean, if you have, you go to the art store and you buy 18 by 24, that everything's 18 by 24. You buy 18 by 24, that's, that's a good enough size you can get going. Um, but how do we begin to compose and draw? Well, Albert Durer kind of single handedly reinvented linear perspective for his generation with a little machine that he made out of a frame with a string grid stretched over the surface and a similarly gridded piece of paper on his desk uh, in front of the artist. Um, and what looks like a candlestick or an obelisk, some kind of, of sight um, instrument that enables the painter, uh, the drawer to keep uh, his head and an eye in one position relative to the squares. Um, this, by, by filling out each square individually, very much in the same way that everybody in third grade did when they were transferring, you know, the Christmas card onto the wall, mm -hmm. uh, square by square, um, Durer was able to, uh, to reconstruct a way of, of presenting light uh, on um, a flat surface. Here's my foundation painting class learning about the principles of linear perspective. This is just one approach to measuring, one, but one that's similar to how a camera records visual information and one that I like myself. So you'll notice that this is my class at Boston University, my freshman foundation painting class. And um, you might be surprised that there are there are no canvases on the easels, and there are no uh, pads or uh, drawing materials, uh, uh, with the exception of the, the, the markers that they're using to draw trace on glass. Um, there are, there's at least one person in this room that has been in this class and has done this assignment. Um, this is what ends up in a five minute exercise a perfectly coordinated room of, of um, information, figures, easels. Uh, it's just coincidental that the reflection of the, mm -hmm. the lights is also very useful here. Um, and we have this uh, box still life, which, well, was virtually impossible to draw if you, unless you had some drawing training. Nine or 10 boxes at all different angles, none of them parallel. Oh boy, they look at me and they say, Oh, is there another class that I can take? <laughs> how we measure the visual situation in front of us determines how we compose and draw. So uh, what are some tools that we can use? I brought three. Uh, a viewfinder, a, a couple of little L's that are clipped together with a bulldog clip, but I can look in and I can say, oh, there's a very nice portrait 
um, or there's a nice situation that I can that I can close with my banging device. But my best friend is my 18 inch ruler. I learned today that an 18 inch ruler is actually a cubit. So this is an ancient device. <laughs> uh, Noah in his ark uh, was constructed out of cubits. Uh, so uh, how do I use this? I use it the same way the students in the class use the glass. I hold it in front of me, there's the glass. If it's at arm's length, that's my place. And I can measure, I can say, well, this person sitting in front of me is um, 11 inches long and four inches wide. And I can make it a 11 by four rectangle and I will have a perfectly proportioned figure. I can, I can uh, do that and subdivide and subdivide until um, I have general information and more precise uh, uh, further information. Another tool that I like is compass with a pair of pencils. And, and I do the same thing. I'm going to throw the Jeremy here and I say, well, at arm's length, which is just constant, uh, I have this distance and I can draw, make a mark on my on my paper with these two pencils. And Jeremy is as well, make a mark on it. How big is his head? This is big. This is called sight sizing. And uh, for me, I, it's very easy. Once you know this, once I tell you, it's like giving away the secret of art. You know, you can do it so simply, and you can start with the big information and make small information. Uh, so you can start with the size of the head, which would be perfectly proportioned, and find where the eyes and nose and ears are if you are willing to adjust this accordingly. If you don't feel this is precise enough, because you know. You know, uh, some artists use a stick and they put it on their on their cheekbone and say, "Okay, now it's four inches by eleven inches, more precise." Uh, seems a little bit nutty, um, but for me, it works out very nice. I can double it, triple it, quadruple it. It starts to get a little funky when I go past four times so it's like so it's Here are two uh, building paintings I made downtown, um, one on State Street and the other on uh, uh, Congress Street. And uh, they represent two different ways of measuring. I made the one on the right first. If you look carefully, you'll see that there is a center line which goes exactly down the middle of the painting. Um, and from that, I measured left and right. Um, this had a uh, horizon, which is somewhere in the center of the painting. And from that, I measured up and down and left and right. In this one, I kept all that vertical information the same because the building was pretty far away. I had a pretty acute angle. And this one, I was looking at like this. So my, uh, my picture plane was no longer uh, like a Leonardo da Vinci picture plane, uh, nice and flat, but it became something more of a hemisphere. And so that's what happens here. And that's why the buildings are curved, not because I used a wide angle lens on a camera, but rather because my measuring system uh, allowed that to occur. Proportion is not a process of addition, but of a division. So Leonard Anderson, wonderful painter, uh, said this, and I think it's a wonderful way of explaining the simple process. Here are, here are uh, th three steps uh, of a tree painting that I'm currently working on. Um, I, I started on a toned canvas that I just made a kind of a thin wash of brown, let that dry, and I made a charcoal drawing. You'll see on the left hand side, I have a, a vertical line and a horizontal line that are exactly in the middle of the painting. I like to know where I am. And then I can add the tree. The tree is, this big, six inches. If I double that or triple it, it'll be 18 inches or 24 inches, whatever it may be. And I just continue that vocabulary, starting with general information, uh, working more specifically, first day of drawing, second day of drawing, then applying pen. Easy, right? Easy, uh -huh. easy. With color, let's try to do 
uh, do the same and keep our terms simple. There are three contrasts I use. Q, which means the color name, redness, yellowness, blueness, value, which means lightness or darkness of a color, and saturation, which is the purity of a color. So red, when you squeeze it out of the tube, is its most saturated. When we add light to it, we actually dull it, but we make it lighter. When we add black to it, of course, we dull it. When we add anything to it except itself, we dull it. So that's reducing saturation. Uh, we can take red out of the tube and add black or blue and make it darker. Um, we can take um, red and add yellow to it and change its hue slightly towards the orange side. So if, if you have those three terms, you can explain your color very nicely. Even with color, proportion is about division. Okay, here's a little assignment that is another um, backbreaker. Uh, we have orange out of the tube on the, on the oh my goodness, is it possible? Um, how's this one look? Oh yeah, this is good, isn't it? Uh, that's the same image. Uh, so we have orange out of the tube over there. I looked over there and said, that's impossible. Uh, then we have um, ultramarine blue out of the tube here, and that doesn't look so good either. Um, I met a, a Channel 5 Chronicle uh, cameraman uh, about a year ago, and he said, you know, cameras don't see violence very well at all. And you know, I thought about it, you know, if you watch the five o'clock news, is you, you you may not notice that the violet dresses don't exist, you know, uh, red and blue, very, very, very strong. Um, well, the blue even in mine is not so great here, but, but here's an effort to take orange and blue and divide them and find the perfect middle, the color that is neither orange nor blue, but somewhere precisely in the middle. And then do that again and again. You can do that as long as you can make discrimination of, of, of here. Um, in this one, and this is really also crazy because the orange here is intended to be the same lightness as, as same saturation, same light, the same color. And then these colors are tinted with white to match those. But in this representation, that's all wrong. I can't even explain it to you. Um, because you can see that this is clearly a darkness. There's any other kind of colors on the, on, the, on this chart. And this is clearly darker than that. So um, are you starting to get a little worried about your camera? Are you getting worried about my camera and, and the projector here? Uh, and the bottom is intended to draw the same value based on a medium value blue. Maybe it's a little better over there. We'll see. But uh, no, I'm really curious to see this because I, I photographed this with mono. Oh, it's better, right? Yeah. It's a little better. But on your iPhone, you have all different kinds of monochromatic programs that you can use, and they're all different. So this is called equal value. Equal value. They are the same lightness or darkness uh, within reason. This gets crazier because if you go outside on the north side of the building on the, at lunchtime, the blues, because of the sky, are going to get lighter. And when you go into the hallway with the incandescent lights, the oranges are going to get lighter. And if you don't believe me, try it out. It, it shocked me when I saw, when I saw this just you know, 10 or 20 years ago. OK, we talked a little bit about composing and drawing and color. And what about that? This is my mantra. This is my five-fingered mantra for how to make a painting or how to evaluate a painting if you're in a critique. How's the composition? How's the drawing? In this order, right? Start out with the thing, uh, draw on it, color it, uh, think about how you touch the surface, think about if you layer it, think about if the painting is thin or thick, think about if you scrape it or wipe it off, and then subject matter, how you interpret subject. So what about technique? Uh, Pablo Casals, the great cello player, says the most perfect technique is that which is not noticed at all. Maybe that's totally impossible, but something to aspire to. I shot this Van Eyck painting in uh, in Washington. Yeah, had a little glare on the top because it's taller than I am. I'm taller than I am, and the lights in the museum are not so 
perfectly calibrated. But take a look at this little place because I'm going to zoom in on that. On the left. Oh. <laughs> Doesn't that give you chills? I don't know. It gives me chills. Uh, it's about this this fragment is about that big, you know. And uh, so we have some nice animals here, and we have uh, some astrological stories going on too. And this is a little fragment of a manet from the same museum. There's different different handwriting here, different touch, and and I think you can feel things in your body uh, that are implications of uh, of how these artists uh, chose to move their hands and what thickness of paint they could use. Here, here are two paintings by two students. Um, we, we do better on that monitor. This is Cedric Huckabee on the left. Uh, I got that guy to pose uh, next to the paintings, uh, which is in the National Portrait Gallery, or was uh, in a special show last year, last February. Um, and this is a tiny little painting. So this is a six foot or seven foot or eight foot painting, very big. This painting is, is as small as a postcard, five by seven inches, uh, made with egg tempera, big thick oil, big brushing, and tiny little marks with, with, uh, with a very small brush. Two wonderful artists, Cedric Huckabee, Elizabeth Mendes. Here's uh, Via Selmans uh, from a show in New York um, about four years ago. Um, there's a rock and there's a bronze sculpture painted to look like mm -hmm. a rock. I don't know which one is which. <laughs> And then this is a, a fragment of Stanley Lewis's show at Betty Cunningham Gallery. Um, Stanley's out there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he'll do anything to keep the painting alive and keep it moving uh, and thrill himself with the possibilities of excess. And subject, although the artwork right now means decidedly subject forward, in my own experience, subject is quite different than subject matter. And it reveals itself to me in slow release capsules. Sometimes this painter is the last to know. <laughs> and I think that may be true for you too. Some subjects are on a loop, and painting for me, for better or worse, is usually autobiography. We're back to the rocket ships. This is a painting that I worked on last summer, uh, not quite finished, 30 by 30. It's the same thing. Um, a rocket getting congested by <laughs> by flowers. <laughs> um, you can do your own interpretation. That's not my job anymore. <laughs> I'm married to a psychiatrist, so <laughs> I've heard it all. Um, I think it, I, I I hope that I have something going here that's that's somewhat complex. Let's go outside. Some inspiring painters who have worked from nature and plan air. Some of you were mentioned here, um, but you know, these are some of my favorites that came to mind immediately when I was making this, this list. Um, so many good people uh, working today and uh, paying very close attention to what's in front of their own nose. Um, I generally go someplace and I work there for as long as I can stand to, and I just often get kicked out. I lived in Rome um, for two years, uh, teaching for Temple University, and I did 30 paintings there. I'm going to show you one. This is a little one uh, from a terrace. I'm working out directly outside uh, from life, um, and uh, this, for me, had a little bit of resonance. Uh, many of these I photographed in 35 millimeter film slides, and I didn't always um, transfer them to digital yet. And so um, here's, a, here's one that was uh, trans, translated to digital. Um, these two houses are right behind the Vatican wall. In fact, the little bit of um, a little bit of fleshy colored uh, uh, rectangle to the far right and, and, uh, and on the middle left are the Vatican wall. Uh, the Pope's helicopter lands right opposite that wall, making a big racket. It's black. Um, 
I took a job at BU in 1989, um, and I always like to go outside to paint. So I found this wonderful neighborhood, Oak Square. Maybe some of you know it. Um, the mobile station on the left is um, no longer there. It's now YMCA. Um, a little liquor store, a couple of a couple of uh, wonderful old houses. Um, I camped out in Oak Square for six months. Uh, in that little rotary next to the firehouse, and I painted everything all the way around. Uh, scale so that they could touch each other and, and make a perfect circle. Um, they were never shown quite that way, but they were shown at Gallery Naga. Um, this is probably the biggest, uh, the longest, and the best of that, of that group. Um, and what about subject? Well, I pumped gas for mobile for many, many years in high school and college. You know, this stuff comes back and bites you. <laughs> uh, I always smelled like gasoline. My mother made me undress in, in the garage and leave my clothes there. Uh, Moon Mobile. Uh, this is the same station. Beautiful time of day, late in the afternoon when the moon is rising in the east. This might be my favorite. It's very, very small. Um, this was my rainy day thing. If it started raining, I had to get out of the square. And there was this big pine tree up on the hill. And I could go under the pine tree and start another painting. So I usually have five or six paintings going at any time, sometimes more. I think I have a dozen going now. Um, and um, I think that for me, I'm trying to represent the particular light of a particular time of day, moisture, humidity, uh, that was important. Um, I think we had a Mustang exactly like that, not a convertible, but here, you know, here's another bit of autobiography. Um, I worked at a World's End and uh, Hingham for a couple of years. Um, I made a lot of paintings there, and um, this is just one. Um, it's called the River in the Rainbow Rock. Um, and it really does deal with that moving of one's head from right to left and trying to represent that space um, comprehensively. Um, the provost at BU gave me permission to paint on the roof of the, of the um, business building. Quant uh, on the on the corner of um, Newmore Square, and uh, so I painted a bunch of paintings there. Here are a couple of small ones, uh, about eleven by twelve inches or so on the left, uh, smaller than that on the right. I'm trying to be uh, attentive to temperature, humidity, time of day. Here's my setup. Uh, they had some window washer um, stabilizers on the roof so I could attach my easel to them because it gets very windy up there. Um, I love going there. Uh, it was the middle of winter, but it was uh, it was wonderful to be there. It was a sabbatical time for me, and uh, and I could just show up and paint until the sun went down. Richard. Yes. Uh, there's a question online. Um, what does it feel like when you're painting from life? These are so very complex paintings that take so much dedication and focus, what does it feel like to make the paintings? <laughs> it feels like the best work that a person could do. Uh, it, you know, it's work, it, and sometimes it's not pleasant because it's cold or it's windy, um, but it is, um, it, it is being in nature. It is being, um, it is being with the universe. And um, from, from my point of view, um, Half an hour outside is worth is worth many many hours indoors. Mm -hmm. I I hope that's the beginning, mm -hmm. and I think I'll try to answer the question as we as as we continue. Mm -hmm. Let's go inside for a bit. Um, so, um, some very nice people who are here arranged of uh, found a way for me to get into a building downtown, uh, in a unrented floor of a, of a financial building. 
And um, they told me I could stay for a couple of weeks. And it turned out that I could stay for a good deal longer. So um, I started making some small paintings. This one uh, is in our house and it's not very big, uh, maybe a 12 inches tall. Um, I call the PM construction because it's kind of like a Mondrian, P Mondrian PM. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, but I love the views uh, from this building on State Street. And, um, and I was able to scale up. So this is a 60 inch painting. Um, I wish it looked as good as it does on my screen. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, and I spend a long time every every day, about the same couple of hours uh, until uh, until I finished. You all recognize the clock time. Mm -hmm. um, another building um, became possible uh, with the same with the same real estate uh, agent, the same real estate um, vice president at this company. And um, she said, I, I have something to show you. And she took me up to the 15th or 17th floor of a building and the blinds were closed and she said, close your eyes. And, I, mm -hmm. and she opened the blinds and she and I was confronted with this reflection uh, in a, a hotel with a glass, glass wall. She said, you think you'd like to paint here? And I said, oh God, what I, you know, this is, this is just such a great opportunity. But how do I make sense of this mess? So I incised three rules for work. Out of clutter, find simplicity, from discord, find harmony. In the middle of difficulty lies mm -hmm. opportunity. Uh, how, how to keep it simple. The gridded windows <laughs> were just like the grids um, that Albert Durer composed with his strings, right? So if I could get the grid, then I could fill in the squares. The grids, to my great surprise, were all different sizes. Um, the, as you move up and down the side of this building, they were all were square or not quite square. I'm gonna measure very carefully. So, but once I had the grid, then I could paint. And so I just, I work on six or seven paintings, keep the information square to square working from, once again, general to specific. So here are three or four paintings from that period. This one's 16 inches square. Um, here's my setup. There's a, a, a medium-sized painting on the easel, but there's a big painting just started behind it. Uh, on the left, that's 50 by 80 inches. And um, I was having the best time of my life. This was like, I don't know, eating Skittles all day or something. <laughs> Here's a, a show that I had of these in Gallery Mock in Boston. Um, the right side image is the picture that was just started on the easel 50 by 80. Uh, maybe some of you uh, who fly Delta uh, may have seen this in the VIP lounge. Um, and uh, the painting on the left on the left is called uh, Floaters, uh, probably the most complex painting I've ever made. Um, it's quite large and, and it, it is a reflection of a reflection of a reflection of a reflection. Um, but I just, you know, started from the same way that I do everything, measure it out, start putting down color, uh, consider the color that goes down a beginning and know that it will change 30 or 40 times before the day, before the painting is finished. Greenway. That will work. <laughs> Bright Moment. I named this after a Ross on Roland Kirk song called Bright Moments. Um, I like jazz, and uh, these paintings seem like a little Broadway building where you can look to. Here's my setup in one of these buildings. This is on Federal Street, um, an on rented floor. I, I managed to stay there for a few months and then they. And then they booted me when they rented it. But um, uh, I made a little trip to the Metropolitan Museum uh, one day, and I saw these Islamic rugs, and they had this centered, uh, heavy design, right? Uh, the prayer rugs and uh, a beautiful border that was equal in size. And I thought, I'm gonna make some paintings just like that. And so I put the buildings in the middle and made sure I measured equal distance around all of them. And I made several several paintings. This uh, 
um, to same idea, right? But just uh, an idea borrowed from another artist and uh, used uh, for my own purposes. So this is called from Franklin Street to Long Wharf, East Boston in the back. This took me a long time. Four point. The yellow building's the center element. Smack in the middle of the building. In art school, they tell you don't put anything in the middle, so I do. <laughs> <laughs> I got kicked out of that building because they rented the floor. Um, and so uh, BU uh, made a made a a scaffolding uh, around the, their castle when they renovated it in the summer of 2018. So uh, a, a professional photographer named Frank Curran walked by and said, do you mind if I photograph your painting? That's me. There's my painting. You can almost, it almost it's almost camouflaged by the, by the, red, by the red screen. Um, but here's the image. Uh, this is stitched together with, uh, it, it's a very tight little space, but it's stitched together to make uh, this panoramic. Here's the painting that I made, 20 by 20. Uh, I call it um, Newcastle. And um, it occurred to me, and when I finished the drawing for this, or when I got the first layer of red on that, it was an awful lot like Vermeer's little house, which uh, fortunately we just saw a couple of weeks ago in Amsterdam. What a beautiful painting. This is a, a winter interior of my studio. And it gets cold, sometimes I go in, inside. I had never made a painting of my, my studio, so here, here it is. That's a detail on the right. Uh, this is the final painting on that, oh, excuse me, on that December day. Oh, it doesn't look so good there. <laughs> Maybe over there, it looks better. It is better. Maybe it's better to be on Zoom, huh? Um, I broke my arm in 2019, January. I slipped on ice and I got a, a real doozy of a, of a break. Um, I needed surgery and I got some metal in my arm now. A little chromium, a little cobalt, a little titanium, all artists, pigment colors, right? Um, so uh, while I was recuperating with my arm in a sling, I still had my drawing hand, so I started um, making drawings out the window of my bedroom and uh, little watercolors. These are very small, four by four inches, four by seven inches. And, um, you know, I I wasn't going anywhere, so I thought maybe I'll, you know, continue this. So this is also out the, out the bedroom window. That's the first uh, stage of the painting on the left and the last stage of the painting on the left. And maybe the other monitor a little better. Um, I found a big tree that I liked, and uh, I, I didn't really know how to pursue this. Uh, it's a complex tree. I thought maybe if I paint like Seurat, I'll figure it out. Um, I actually cop tried to copy a Seurat so I could learn how to do this. Um, and I realized that maybe bigger marks and a, a variety of marks were going to be better. Um, Photographs really lie. The, the painting on the left isn't as good as the painting on the right, but it looks better here. So this is my backyard. Here I am on the porch. I could be inside staying warm, but you know, I don't like the glass very much. If I have to use glass, I'll, I'll take it, but but I'd rather be out on the porch. Uh, here's my porch. Uh, there's a six foot painting of the tree just started with charcoal and then uh, uh, underpainting. Uh, and there it is on the left, almost complete. Uh, and two more uh, just started on the right, both about six feet tall. You know, I grew up, uh, you know, where I made those drawings on the sidewalk, uh, it was a, a gray cement floor, it had a white picket fence, it was a white house, you know, some things don't change. Uh, here's, here I am working on one in the middle of the winter, uh, still pretty warm outside. I, I don't go out when it's uh, below 32 uh, because it's not good for the painting. Here's one that's minus 10, so I'm indoors. <laughs> what happens outside that doesn't happen inside? Touch. Temperature, humidity, the feel of tree bark, pine cones, pine needles, 
You smell the grass, smell the diesel trucks. You hear the crows and the geese and the owls and the deer and the kids and the bicycles and taste the air and see the shadows come and go. That's what's fun about it. Here's some of my friends. They land right on my fingers while I eat. <laughs> they like me. Dragonflies, I love them. Um, how about that owl? Um, I don't see too many owls, but I got that one. Yeah. You know, get, getting your, your iPhone out in time is uh, is challenging. We had a woodpecker yeah. and a lot of these little toads that hide under my umbrella. And the deer. <laughs> my wife calls this deer buffet. They eat my arborvitae trees. Um, and so I, I started painting the arborvitaes. Here's here's their lunch. Huh. I showed you this unfinished one. Um, the hibiscus was bare in April. I decided to make a big painting this uh, summer, 60 inches square. Uh, and so here it is uh, uh, in the first day of drawing. And uh, here it is in the first day of putting on a little bit of color. And here it is with a little more. And here's my easel uh, on a music stand. And I have to use about 30 or 40 pounds of rocks so it doesn't become a sailboat. Um, the first leaves appeared in May. Um, just keeping it going. Here's my kid, Diana doing homework in front of my motif. There's the, the tree, you can see the, the arborvita on the right uh, with the neighbor's uh, hibiscus tree uh, behind it. This, this is the first leaving of that. And I knew I had to start early if I wanted to get this finished. The blossoms appeared at the end of July. So I'm, I'm starting to put in some white flowers, which were very helpful because then I can negotiate by points in space. Some details. Pain's getting better, but a little more elaborated. More flowers. Little details. Uh, there it is in early September, I think. September 25th. Uh, we went to Europe and uh, around the first week of September. And when we came back, there were no flowers left. <laughs> So I put the painting away and I've been working on, oh, there's there's finding one's ancestral roots of a Roman painting that is a little wall with flowers, mm -hmm. with flowery tree behind, you know, nobody's original. Yeah. Or as my one of my teachers would say, you're only as original as the obscurity of your sources. <laughs> <laughs> so here are some paintings in progress. Uh, these are all 12 inches or so by 24 inches, all double squares mostly uh, in various states of, uh, of, of season and finish. So, not yet. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and uh, I'd be happy to take questions if you have any. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>